So our starting point should actually be to start the first line of the Communist Manifesto, which is, of course, the history of all hitherto existing society. It's the history of class struggle, and that's really the lens through which we have to view what's going on in Ukraine uh, from a class point of view. So last November, about a year ago, uh, the then President Yanukovych changed, changed his mind at the last minute on uh, signing a deal with the EU. He, went, he switched from the EU to, uh, to signing a deal with Russia instead. Now, it's important to note uh, that the reason he did this is nothing to do with uh, political alignment, particularly. Um, he's often described as a, a pro-Russian uh, oligarch, a pro-Russian president. Um, and that's true, but not because he's uh, not be it's not because he has uh, some kind of uh, national or had some kind of nationalist uh, attachment or sentimental attachment to Russia as opposed to the West. Um, he uh, he's simply uh, acting in the way that the oligarchs who have run Ukraine for the last twenty years have always been acting and have been acting for all the time they've been in power, which is basically just looking for the best deal, playing all the sides off against each other and looking for the best deal. And, uh, and the reality is that Russia offered uh, the better deal when it came to signing this deal uh, in uh, last year, in November. Now, the origins of this really lie in, uh, in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, because when, Cap uh, when, uh, when uh, socialism well, formed, uh, form of socialism that existed in the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, it, the GDP of Ukraine went uh, from $82 billion in 1989, it dropped by 2000 to $31 billion, so an enormous collapse in uh, GDP. And, uh, and in 1999, production levels were 40% below what they were in 1991. And as well as this economic collapse, there was a, general, a generalized collapse across the whole of society. So uh, living standards, life expectancy, they both uh, dropped very dramatically in a short space of time. Joblessness increased, drug addiction, alcohol abuse, all of these things uh, came about with the collapse of the USSR. And, uh, and of course, massive migration as well, people leaving, uh, leaving the country, most of it illegal, uh, obviously. But uh, it was in this context, then, that the kind of capitalism that exists today in Ukraine, mafia capitalism, emerged. So uh, wealthy individuals, normally uh, individuals who had previously actually been part of the state apparatus uh, in the so un under the Soviet system in the USSR, um, not the deformed Soviet system, um, these people became the oligarchs, basically. They seized state property and defended it with private armies. Uh, and this, these are the people, then, who have been running the country for the last 20 years. And all of them, throughout this whole period, have shifted political positions in very short spaces of time, seemingly on a whim. So Poroshenko himself, the current president in Ukraine, actually, he has been a minister for the last 15 years. He's been a minister in every single government that there's been in Ukraine. And he's supported every successful movement against those same governments over the last uh, 15 years. So he's a very slippery character. Just one example of how these people operate. The point is, they're not pro-Russian or pro-Western or pro-this or that. All they're pro is themselves. All they care about is their own wealth, their own material, in material interests. And so switching deals at the last minute was not, a, not an unusual thing to have happened. It wasn't, a, wasn't an expression of a particular political alignment. It was just Poroshenko doing what, uh, uh, sorry, it was just Yanukovych doing what uh, all the oligarchs have been doing for the last 20 years, which is, uh, which is defending their own interests above all. Um, and, uh, and the fact that this happened, and the crisis that it sparked, really is an indication of, uh, of what's going on on a global scale. Because, uh, first of all, it obviously highlights the weakness of German capitalism. Because there was a time when Germany would have, uh, would have spared no expense in trying to integrate countries in Eastern Europe into the EU, uh, and there's been a definite uh, move in that direction uh, over the last period, ever since the collapse of the USSR. But, uh, but now the cost of integrating a country like Ukraine into the EU would be unbearable for Germany, because realistically it would be Germany that would be bearing the cost of that from the EU's point of view. The cost of underwriting the debt and restructuring the businesses and so on. Germany doesn't have the money for that. And actually, the deal it was offering uh, to Ukraine, to uh, Yanukovych, to Ukraine, was a very poor deal. It was, uh, it was about a billion dollars with loads of strings attached, um, which wasn't uh, when, when Ukraine had uh, enormous, much, much larger debts than that uh, at the time. Um, and uh, Russia, on the other hand, because the other thing that this illustrates is the belligerence of Russia and the position that Putin is trying to establish for himself in the region on a global scale. 
Uh, Peter knew exactly what he was doing by offering a much better deal, a deal of about $15 billion with preferential rates of interest and all the rest of it. It demonstrated the power of, the relative power of Russia on an economic scale. It's got certain uh, revenues from oil that mean that it's been able to weather the, uh, the collapse a little bit better um, and the crisis and so on. But, uh, but yeah, it really represents their belligerence in, this, in, in, the kind of, uh, in the world as it is at the moment, in the world uh, in crisis. More than anything, uh, this whole situation, the crisis that emerged <coughs> switching uh, by Yanukovych of, the, of his position, really reflects the weakness of U.S. imperialism at this time as well, the declining power of it. Obviously, the U.S. is still the dominant uh, imperialist power in the world. Um, <clears throat> there's no doubt about it. But uh, its power is declining compared to what it, uh, what it used to be. It can no longer get its way as it once did, and it can no longer strike these blows against uh, countries like Russia where it would like to. So as we know, this move sparked the Euromaidan movement, as it was, uh, as it was known, uh, which saw large numbers of people come out onto the streets uh, in protest uh, against, uh, or seemingly against this kind of switch uh, by Yanukovych. And many people uh, who participated in this movement, certainly at first at least, um, participated uh, for progressive reasons. Uh, they saw this as a movement <coughs> against a corrupt oligarch, Yanukovych, which is exactly, obviously, uh, what he is. He, he's a corrupt oligarch. And people in Ukraine are sick of this uh, mafia capitalism that's dominated their country for the last 20 years, this plundering of the state, this privatization of mines, which started under Yanukovych. That's not a new thing. Uh, this, uh, all this stuff was going on before. People are sick of it. They want control over their own lives. Uh, they're, uh, they're suffering, and they want to take power back into their own hands. So people saw this uh, initially as uh, perhaps a movement against this, this corruption and, uh, and this mafia capitalism. But very quickly, rapidly, the real character of this movement became clear, and it was a very reactionary movement, um, fundamentally. Um, the, uh, in fact, a, a study came out uh, recently in Ukraine that said that 25% of the uh, participants in the Euromaidan movement were uh, extreme right-wing uh, groups, organized, carefully organized extreme right-wing groups. And obviously in the midst of a, of a movement where there is little organization, few other organizations or political programs, a group as large as a quarter, which is carefully organized with a clear program and everything else, um, is able to impose its, uh, its program and its methods of organization on, on the movement as a whole. And it was these far-right uh, groups, these fascist groups, that were used as the shock troops, basically. Uh, they were the ones who fought the battles with the police and so on uh, during this Maidan movement. And uh, the trade unionists and uh, Communist Party supporters, left supporters, basically, who, who tried to get involved with this movement in the early stages when they did see it as a movement against a corrupt oligarch and everything else, uh, they had their banners torn down and uh, they were beaten up, forced out of the demonstrations and so on, their stalls overturned and everything else. So the character of this movement became very clear very early on, uh, and it was not a, not, not a progressive movement. It was very clear, very clearly a reactionary character. Um, now this movement led to the fall of Yanukovych, not so much because of the strength of the movement itself. Uh, the movement ebbed and flowed and um, changed in various ways throughout the course of it. Uh, and eventually Yanukovych fell. As I say, not so much because of the strength of the movement, but because he basically had so little support from the people who uh, elected him in the first place. As I say, he was as corrupt as anybody else, and he uh, had alienated his base of support, mostly in the east and the south of the country. <coughs> they had no reason to support this guy anymore. He was, national he was privatizing their, uh, their the state assets in the regions and so on. He was pursuing uh, austerity politics in, in one way or another. And, uh, and so they didn't support him. So he had a complete lack of support, a complete vacuum underneath him. And so it didn't take very much uh, to topple him. Now, the government that replaced him, replaced him um, was not one, and it's worth pointing, this is worth pointing out, because this was a government, the one that replaced him, that was immediately recognized by uh, all the countries in the West as a legitimate uh, democratic government and so on. But it didn't come to power through ordinary uh, democratic roots. It actually, it was, uh, it was a coup, more or less. Uh, it certainly had elements of a coup, because uh, when, this, when this government was elected in, the parliament building was being guarded by, uh, by far-right groups, by fascists. Uh, and at the same time as the vote was taking place in the parliament, uh, there, were, there were MPs, uh, Communist Party representatives and so on, being beaten up at the same time as this vote was taking place. And yet this government that was then, uh, then put in place 
was recognized immediately by the West, by Europe and so on, as being the legitimate government of Ukraine. It doesn't take much to see why they would ignore uh, these things, because obviously Yanukovych wouldn't <coughs> sign a deal with them. So they were looking for, uh, for a government that would. Um, <clears throat> so this, uh, this government that then, uh, that then came to power, Following the Maidan movement, uh, we can call it a kind of it was a, a right-wing reactionary bourgeois government with fascist elements. It wasn't a fascist government, um, but it uh, it certainly incorporated a lot of fascist elements. So, for example, there was a party called Svoboda, which uh, which held a number of ministerial positions despite having very few, very little electoral support. Seemingly held a number of ministerial positions, and this is a party that uh, traces its heritage back to Stepan Bandera and uh, the Ukrainian insurgent army which allied itself with the, uh, with the Nazis at the beginning of the Second World War uh, to fight against uh, the USSR, and, uh, and contains a number of hard-right uh, neo-fascist elements. And, uh, and the Fatherland Party as well, again a party that uh, contains a, a number of hard extreme-right elements, was also part of this new coalition government. And even a, a group called the Right Sector was invited to participate in this government. They declined. But the right sector is uh, is as hard is as neo-fascist as they come. They have all kinds of uh, emblems and and everything else that uh, were used in the Third Reich and everything and and, and so on. Um, so uh, this was really the the nature of this government: is reactionary bourgeois government, but incorporated these uh, these kind of elements. And the first act then of this new uh, this newly constituted uh, government, this parliament, was uh, to revoke a language law that had been passed under Yanukovych which gave the right of minority, or gave minorities the right to speak their own language. And, uh, and this, uh, this is obviously a significant question in Ukraine, where there are a number of uh, minorities and everything else. And uh, the first act of the parliament was to revoke that law. Now it proved so controversial, the, the, the attempt to repeal that law, that the president never signed it into, uh, into actual law. But uh, the fact that the parliament voted in favour of that was enough, basically. That was its first act. It was enough to demonstrate the real character of this, uh, of this government. This whole thing, this, uh, this movement the government brought to power, that first act of revoking the law, was a provocation to people in the east of the country in particular. Uh, I mean, even to the, kind of, the oligarchs in the east, or the middle classes, the business people in the east, because they themselves have no interest, or have very little interest, in, ally in an alliance with the EU. Because they're, most of their exports go to Russia and so on. An alliance with the EU would mean tariff barriers would go up with Russia, and their, uh, their business would actually suffer. So even these uh, elements, uh, even the, the oligarchs in the middle class and so on, had uh, the, the, the industrialists, basically, in the East, which is where a lot of Ukraine's industry is based, had very little interest in this Maidan movement and this pro-EU alliance. That's the first thing. But uh, the nature of the kind of extreme Ukrainian nationalism uh, that, that characterized the Maidan movement and the government that came to power, the revocation of the, the language law, we must all speak Ukrainian, we're all Ukrainians, none of us rights to minority stuff. The extreme nationalism was a real provocation to people in the East, where, as I say, there are a huge number of, uh, of minority groups. Now, the national question as well is, is amplified in Ukraine because it's a, it's a very uh, complex, sensitive question in that country. Precisely because of the policy of Stalin in, uh, in the USSR and, and the effects that Stalin's policy had. Lenin always had, Lenin and the, the, the Bolsheviks always had a policy of, uh, on the national question of a recognition of the rights of minorities. You have to recognize the rights of, uh, of minority groups because in that way uh, those minority groups will then see that, uh, that the, the working class, the kind of oppressor nation if you like, has no interest in oppressing those minority groups and stuff. If you say that you have the absolute right to self-determination and the right to speak your own language and everything else, then those people will realize, well, do you know what, these Bolsheviks, they're not out to oppress us. And actually, I mean, in a dialectical way, in a kind of contradictory way, that will cause them to, to move closer towards the Bolsheviks and view them in a, in a better light. Uh, and so the, Lenin was extremely sensitive to this national question. This is the policy that he pursued. Uh, when he was uh, leading the Bolsheviks. Now Stalin trampled all over that policy. He ignored it. He completely did, he was, a, he was what we can refer to as a great Russian chauvinist. He trampled all over the rights of uh, minority groups uh, throughout the USSR, including <coughs> and especially actually in Ukraine. And so the forced collectivization and everything else had an enormously uh, detrimental impact on people in Ukraine. And that is still remembered. 
the, the trampling of those kind of uh, rights. So the national question is a very sensitive one in, uh, in Ukraine. So for this parliament, this government, to uh, try and, uh, again, trample all over the rights of uh, these people was a very clear provocation uh, that people in the East couldn't ignore. I've already mentioned uh, Svoboda's links to Stepan Bandera, who, uh, who was this, the, the leader of this uh, group that allied themselves with the Nazis in the first couple of years of the, first few years of the uh, Second World War, um, and perpetrated all kinds of massacres throughout the country, uh, particularly against Poles and so on. Um, but uh, but that has that again is acts of provocation to people in the East. Many of whom actually fought uh, fought fascism, fought the Nazis alongside the Red Army, and many of them still have the medals to prove it. Many people in the East still have these medals they were given for fighting alongside the Red with the Red Army against uh, fascism. So to incorporate a party into a into a government uh, that has the traces trace its heritage from and, and, and calls of call. Uh, or, Reveres as a hero, people like Stefan Bandera, is obviously a, a serious provocation. Um, and then you had uh, also the government appointed various oligarchs in the south and the east, uh, people who people like Kolomoisky, uh, who uh, basically funded these funds these fascist groups, props himself up, at, up entirely with them, and uh, and then he becomes the governor in in a, in a region, in a town in. Uh, uh, of the country. It's clearly, again, a provocation for people living there. So, uh, what you had then is this anti Maidan movement growing up. You had an anti Maidan movement composed of a number of different elements. Uh, it wasn't a clear, uh, a kind of homogenous group. There were all kinds of people participating <coughs> for different reasons, but clearly at the forefront, more than anything else, were, uh, were economic and democratic uh, questions. So the fact that this wasn't a clearly uh, democratic government, it was provoking people in the East, and, uh, and it was continuing the policies that Yanukovych continued, if not uh, with more vigour, pursuing the policies of austerity and so on that the EU and the IMF were, uh, was, were imposing on, on the country. And, uh, and you can see this then in the, uh, in the Declaration of Sovereignty by the Donetsk Republic, because the things that, were, that were, were most prevalent in that Declaration of Sovereignty were things like uh, the primacy of collective ownership of property over individual ownership of property. These kind of questions were at the forefront of that Declaration of Sovereignty. So this was the, uh, uh, initially, this was the primary element in, uh, in, in, in the, in the anti-Maidan movement. But then, of course, you also had uh, very reactionary elements in this movement as well, Russian nationalism in particular. Um, because you saw in these demos, in these anti maidan demos, people waving Tsarist uh, you know, Russian Empire flags uh, and this kind of thing. So there are a few of, uh, a few of those people. And actually, you look at the Donetsk Republic's constitution, which obviously came later, came after the Declaration of Sovereignty, and it seems then that in that, const in, in that declaration, in that constitution, these nationalist elements have come to the fore. And you see uh, things like the, uh, the primacy of the Russian Orthodox Church being... Uh, being talked about and all these kind of things being, being highlighted. So you see these uh, very reactionary elements coming to the fore uh, by the time this constitution comes about. Now, uh, what's very clear, and, and this is what I'll come on to, to talk about, is that where there's a lack, and this is an important, this is something maybe we can develop in the discussion a little bit, um, <clears throat> there's a, where there's a lack of a strong left presence in a movement like this anti-Maidan movement, these uh, reactionary nationalist elements can come to the fore and they can dominate the movement just as the organized, although it was only a quarter of the movement, the, the Maidan movement, the right, uh, the extreme right, the fascist elements came to dominate the Maidan movement because they were organized, they had a program and an organization and so on. Where that's lacking in a potentially progressive movement, uh, you can get these reactionary elements coming to the fore, the nationalists and so on. And, uh, and so where there's no uh, organized left presence, this is what happens. Now, the reason, part of the reason for this, uh, this, this weakness of the left, if you like, in, uh, in the anti-Maidan movement, was due, uh, largely, to attacks by the government and the fascists on left-wing organizations. So you had all kinds of, uh, of things going on. The Communist Party... Uh, in Ukraine, which is a party that got 2.6 million votes uh, in the previous, uh, like not the one that happened on Sunday, but the previous one, um, and uh, and obviously and had a number of MPs in Parliament uh, previously, 
Um, and, uh, and a Marxist organization called Barak. But both, both of these things, so both of these organizations, were forced underground due to attacks on their offices. Their, their offices were ransacked by, uh, by far-right uh, groups. Uh, members of Barokba, there was an attempt to kidnap a, a whole uh, group of Barokba members in broad daylight. Uh, a bunch of fascists in military fatigue with Kalashnikovs just uh, just jumped them and tied them up and tried to kidnap them. Um, and as I said, they were forced to move their head offices to both the Communist Party and Barokba, forced to move to other uh, other cities out of Kiev. Yeah. There have been murders of Communist Party secretaries, there were kidnaps of uh, Communist <coughs> Party members as well. There was, uh, coming up to six months ago actually, on the 2nd of May, a massacre in Odessa, in the trade union building, the town called Odessa, the trade union building there, where, uh, where it was burned to the ground, and the right sector now have uh, claimed responsibility for that. They boasted about uh, doing that. And, uh, and people, uh, trade unionists, communists, were jumping out of the windows, trying to escape, and as they were uh, jumping out, they were shot at and everything else by the, by the fascists who were there, uh, attacking the building. You've also seen uh, about at least uh, 42 people died, 42 uh, trade unionists died in that uh, massacre. You've also seen toppling of, uh, oh, the toppling of statues of Lenin all across the country by these, uh, by these far-right groups and parties and so on. Attacks on a peace march called by the Communist Party. Um, and the Communist Party faction, prior to, as I say, prior to the, the elections on Sunday, uh, there were a number of Communist Party uh, MPs in Parliament and they had a faction, and the faction was disbanded in Parliament, uh, and, uh, and proceedings started in court, which are still ongoing, uh, to try and ban the Communist Party. A party that has 2.6 million votes, and, uh, and um, proceedings were started against them to try and uh, ban it uh, altogether. So, uh, obviously, all of these attacks uh, perpetrated by uh, the government and its fascist supporters serve to weaken the left uh, Country. So it's quite difficult then to have a kind of organised presence in a movement like the anti maidan movement, inevitably. And of course on the other side, on the other side of the same coin, is the strengthening of kind of feelings of Russian nationalism uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the things is obviously uh, Russia's own behaviour in relation to Crimea, annex Crimea, um, on the basis of a, of a vote that was taken uh, which said that the vast majority of people there wanted to be part of, uh, of Russia. Now, uh, now, Russia, whatever the case, after the installation of this, uh, this government, Russia was never going to let Crimea go. It, it, would have found, uh, it would have found any pretext to, to annex it and take it over, because there's a, a very important uh, naval base there for Russia. It's its only warm water naval base. So it was never, never not going to uh, annex Crimea. And also, uh, the vast majority of the people, or it would face very little opposition in Crimea to doing that from, uh, from the, the majority of the population. Now, it's a diff and obviously people looked at that, people in Donetsk and Luhansk looked at that and thought, well, all we need to do is declare sovereignty and then Russia will, uh, will, will come and kind of uh, annex us as well. And, that, uh, that, and the Russian nationalists were able to make that argument and give that argument a bit of weight and give it a bit of uh, credence because of what happened in Crimea. So Russia's, act Russia's actions in Crimea uh, kind of gave the Russian nationalists a bit more of a platform in the East at that time. Now Russia in reality probably had uh, no, no interest in, um, well it definitely didn't have an interest in annexing Luhansk and Donetsk because uh, for the same reason the EU don't really want to incorporate uh, Ukraine into the EU because they can't afford it, Putin can't really afford to restructure all the businesses in the East of the country which are uh, have corruption kind of inbuilt and they're just there to sort of, they're being milked by the oligarchs there. Uh, Putin doesn't really want to have to take responsibility for that. All he really wants is a bit of control, a bit of influence in the country, uh, just to be able to kind of assert his own uh, presence there. So that was never really going to happen. But it allowed the Russian nationalists the kind of uh, ability to argue um, these, kind of, uh, these kind of things. Um, <clears throat> People could also uh, point as well, and this isn't actually a particularly reactionary thing necessarily. It's not, but but it gave kind of the Russian nationalists a bit more of a support, a bit more support, a bit more of a weight to their arguments. Ordinary people in the east of Ukraine would point to Russia and say, "Look, the workers in Russia, ordinary people in Russia, they get much higher wages than we do here in Ukraine, and we want we want a bit of that. We want a piece of uh, those higher wages." Now that's obviously an illusion, clearly. Uh, simply being incorporated into Russia or annexed by Russia or whatever. 
um, wouldn't necessarily result in higher wages, it certainly wouldn't solve the problems of exploitation and everything else. But there were certain illusions along those lines, and that's not uh, necessarily, a, that, that's not basically saying, yeah, we're pro the Russian Empire, we're pro Putin or anything else. It's basically just saying we want a better standard of living, and we, we think uh, we can get it through, uh, through that and those means. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and then the third thing that gave the Russian nationalists a bit, of, uh, a bit of a push was actually elements, again, not a reactionary thing, elements of Soviet nostalgia. People thinking, people looking back to a time under the USSR when, despite all the difficulties, they had a roof over their head, and they had education, they had food, and, uh, and they had a job, and they had some sort of security, as compared to now, as I, I described the collapse that came about at the time of the, for the USSR. And, uh, and the reality for many people now is there's a complete lack of security. Uh, and so there were elements of Soviet nostalgia. You saw Soviet uh, flags being waved on some of these demonstrations and so on. That, again, <clears throat> is not a reaction. It's, obviously, it's a complete illusion, the idea that uh, Putin is, is some, sort of, um, you know, some sort of communist in any way is obviously nonsense. Um, but, uh, but the fact that, they, that that nostalgia was there allowed them, has allowed the nationalists, or did at the time allow the nationalists, uh, to come to the fore a little bit more. Um, so this is really uh, part of some of the explanation for, uh, for the different trends, the different currents, and why certain, some of them came to have come to the fore uh, and not others in this period. Uh, during, at the beginning of and throughout the, uh, the existence of the, the People's Republics in the East. Now, uh, as we know, the government felt like it couldn't control the, the separatists, uh, and the fascists for that matter, actually, uh, after a certain point. And so it launched the anti-terrorist operation, as it called it, the anti-terrorist operation, the ATO, um, which was essentially a war against its own people in the East. It sent its troops to, uh, to shell the, the cities and the towns. Uh, people in the East. Um, and, uh, and there are a number of important points to draw out of, of this, uh, of this ATO, this anti-terrorist operation, this war, because uh, it highlighted a lot of things. First of all, <coughs> when, uh, when the troops were first sent into the East, they were, they were being told, look, you're going to fight Russian terrorists, basically. Uh, there's all kinds of Russian terrorists stirring up lots of uh, difficulties in the East. You're going to go and uh, fight them and, and liberate the people in the East. Now what happened is that uh, the troops arrived in uh, the east of the country and realized that that wasn't the case. All they found, they didn't find Russian terrorists. All they found were people trying to defend their own homes, ordinary Ukrainians trying to defend their own homes against a government that had launched a war against them. And, uh, and what you saw then, there were all kinds of reports of fraternization between civilians and the troops who were sent to, uh, to fight them. There were instances of whole truckloads of troops just refusing to fight, turning around, going, leaving in some cases uh, their weapons, but just leaving, put, putting their weapons down and driving, uh, driving away, refusing to, to fight and so on. Now obviously from the government's point of view this was terrible, they couldn't allow this kind of thing to happen. And uh, they needed some, they needed troops to fight in the East. Now, if their regular troops, if the regular army troops were refusing to do that, they would have to rely on other people. And uh, and obviously there were no, there was no shortage, thanks to the the Maida movement and everything else, no shortage of organised fascists who then formed uh, what were known as volunteer, what are still known as volunteer battalions, the Azov Battalion, the Donbass Battalion. Actually, the Azov Battalion is now a regiment, uh, which is a, a bigger, more official thing. Um, and uh, and they, they basically the, the result of this kind of fraternisation uh, was greater reliance by the state on these fascists, on these far right extreme uh, right elements, and uh, a greater incorporation of these people into the state apparatus. So that's the first thing uh, we can say about about the effect of the ATO. Um, I've already mentioned uh, the, these instances of troops refusing to fight, but you saw more widespread uh, mutinies and so on. Actually, very recently, just a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, even uh, about three weeks ago, you saw uh, a group of soldiers march in uh, march on Kiev, uh, demanding to be demobilized, <coughs> refusing to fight, saying, "Look, we're only supposed to be conscripted for a year. We've been fighting for a year and a half, and we've had enough." And there were there were mutinies of soldiers. On the basis that they'd only been sent to the they've been sent to the front with no body armor, very few bullets, a couple of days training, no food, and they were they were, they were mutinies against uh, against their commanders and, and the government uh, as a result. And also, of course, uh, there were big movements of the wives and uh, and daughters and so on, uh, 
of the of the soldiers being sent from the west uh, to the front in the east. Uh, this was in the west. This was as far west as uh, Lviv and so on, um, <clears throat> where uh, where they were cutting down trees to block the roads to stop the troops uh, being sent to the west. And the slogans chanted on those kind of demonstrations were things like, "Look, we had nothing to do with the Maidan movement. This was not our. Uh, this is not our government. This was not our choice." Why don't you send your kids to go and fight in the East? Why don't, why don't the president and the MPs, why don't they send their kids to go and fight in the East? Why are you sending our uh, kids? And, uh, and what you saw then is, this, is uh, the, ele- the, the seeds, if you like, of a class, uh, class content being brought out. Uh, Marxists often say that war is the, is the midwife of revolution. And it's for precisely this reason that, uh, that, they, that people begin to recognize this is not a war being fought in there. They're not, they're not being forced to fight a war. They're not being forced to sacrifice for themselves. They're being forced to sacrifice in the interests of the oligarchs, in the interests of people who, who care only about their own wealth. And so you started to see this class content being uh, brought out. That was the second thing that you can uh, say about the ATO. Now, on the other side, then, on the side of the rebels, you can uh, it, it drew out a particularly uh, important point, which is that in a situation like war, like uh, that it existed with this, uh, the Civil War. It really allows uh, adventuring elements to the fore, elements of uh, people who kind of are not, uh, not necessarily progressive in any way, they don't really have any kind of social or economic measures to offer. It allows to the fore people who are good at giving orders and good at firing guns. These are the people who come into leadership positions in the time of, uh, in the time of war. And this is what you saw then on the rebel side. There was, for example, a guy called Strelkov, who uh, is no longer in place as uh, leader of the armed resistance in the East, but he was, and he was a thoroughly uh, reactionary, thoroughly unpleasant uh, guy. He uh, was essentially a mercenary, an adventurer, he just uh, enjoyed fighting and killing and so on. And he was leader, as I say, of the armed resistance in the East. The nature of the conflict allowed these people to come uh, to the fore, as I say, very little organized uh, left presence and so on. It allows these elements to the fore, and so it's not surprising when you read something like the uh, constitution of Donetsk Republic that has all these reactionary elements to it, because in a state of war, uh, all these uh, all these uh, rotten kind of uh, reactionary elements really uh, come forward, uh, and so this is kind of what happened in the east. Um, <clears throat> now the uh, the anti-terrorist operation eventually was defeated, uh, and that in itself really highlighted the weakness of the and the division within the Ukrainian uh, regime within within the the. Uh, presidential regime, the, the parliament and the government and so on. Because there are all kinds of divisions between the oligarchs, which persist to this day, and I'll come on to that. Um, and uh, there was obviously as well enormous demoralization of the troops uh, in the East, because they were basically there as an occupying force. They were not there as, you know, with, as they had been told, with all the support of the local population trying to ex- expel the uh, Russian terrorists who were flooding the country, uh, as they had been told. They were there as an occupying force having to fight against the civilians in the East uh, and uh, being unable to rely on, on them for food and, and shelter and everything else. Uh, and that obviously has, a, has an enormous demoralizing effect. And obviously the corruption, the incompetence that exists in Ukraine prior to the Maidan movement amongst the oligarchs and everything else that didn't disappear overnight, that's all still there as well. So all these things uh, combined really obviously led to, they made an extremely rotten uh, leadership of the ATO uh, and, uh, and, and led to its, uh, to its ultimate defeat, which is when Poroshenko, in a, in a panic, very hastily signed this, uh, this ceasefire agreement that uh, very few people seem to have actually kept to. But as well, uh, the defeat of the ATO really highlighted the weakness of the West. <coughs> Because uh, they couldn't basically intervene in this war. Poroshenko was begging them, begging NATO to intervene, send some troops, this kind of thing. And they did absolutely nothing. They offered warm words of encouragement, condemned Putin, condemned it, condemned everything, and did absolutely nothing. Um, and uh, the reality is, they couldn't intervene, partly because of uh, lack of public support at home. Look what happened when they tried to intervene in, uh, in Syria. Uh, it was humiliating for, for the ruling class in Britain and, and the US. Uh, there's no appetite for war in, in the West at the moment. And, uh, and also, uh, they couldn't intervene because they didn't want to... Intervening would essentially, if the West intervened in Ukraine, it would basically be sparking a war with Russia, it would be provoking a war with Russia. 
And not only can they not afford that, but uh, but they really don't. They need Russia actually on a on a global scale. Because if you think about uh, what else is going on around the world, think about the position of the U.S. in the Middle East, trying to fight ISIS and so on. Um, they uh, to, in order to do that, they have to rely on help from Assad uh, in uh, Syria, much to their own embarrassment. And uh, who is Assad allied with? Well, he's allied with uh, Putin in Russia. So they need one of Putin's allies in the Middle East to pursue their interests there. But in Ukraine, they're, uh, they're, they're opposed to Putin. So they're playing a very, they're, they're playing a very difficult game. Uh, and they're caught between a rock and a hard place. So they couldn't really, the US and, and its lackeys in NATO, couldn't really intervene uh, for fear of upsetting uh, diplomatic relations elsewhere. And of course, throughout this whole process as well, you saw the real divisions between, uh, between, within the West itself, between, for example, the US and Germany. They have very different interests in related. The US has no real, direct, at the moment anyway, direct economic interests in Ukraine, or it didn't when, when things uh, first kicked off. Whereas Germany obviously relies on gas coming through Ukraine from Russia. So Germany doesn't want to upset Putin too much, whereas uh, the US is, is all for upsetting Putin as much as possible, because it can afford to. And so you've seen uh, conflict and division between uh, between Germany and, and uh, the U.S. Um, but uh, so so this is what the ATO really brought out. This is what uh, events up to now really brought out. All these kind of questions. But uh, what we're going to see, I think, and what we saw at the time uh, to some extent, but now that there has been this kind of uh, alleged, supposed ceasefire and uh, everything else, you're really going to see economic questions coming to the fore. You saw them at the time as well, because the economic situation in Ukraine is atrocious. By the end of this year, the economy will collapse by 10% in one year. Inflation's at 14%. There's massive austerity being imposed, and it's being ratcheted up every, uh, every week or so. Every time there's a new uh, big development, there's enormous austerity. There's been wage and pension freezes, uh, the lifting of subsidies on things like heating. Heating prices have gone up 30% uh, since the over the last year. And uh, there's obviously a massive privatisation process, and in fact it was announced this week that uh, they're, they're going to privatise everything, and anything that they can't find a buyer for, they're just going to liquidate. This is, uh, this is the reality of the economic situation in Ukraine at the moment. This is, this is the policies that are being uh, imposed by the IMF and the EU. They have now signed a deal with, uh, although not all of its uh, provisions are being implemented right, uh, right away. But these are the kind of conditions being imposed on people. Now, you cannot go through those kind of uh, economic changes without these questions coming to the fore. And obviously, these are class questions. It's not the oligarchs who are going to be uh, without eating in the winter. It's not the oligarchs who aren't going to be able to afford food or uh, have their pensions cut or anything else. It's ordinary people. And so class questions begin to come to the fore. Uh, where, whereas uh, before, during the war and everything else, they were being cut across by, uh, by nationalism of various shades. Now you're really going to see class questions coming to the fore. And, uh, and you've seen this in a couple of uh, instances. Most recently, actually, uh, there have been uh, reports. And it's difficult to get very accurate reports out of uh, people's republics because uh, the news services obviously limited. They've been damaged, seriously damaged by the, by the civil war and the attacks of the, of the government and so on on the cities. But, uh, but there are reports that uh, there have been nationalizations of major enterprises owned by oligarchs like Akhmatov and, uh, and so on. Um, nationalization by uh, the People's Republics, referred to actually, they refer to themselves as the, the, these nationalizations, these expropriations, they say, uh, have been uh, approved by the Donetsk Soviet. Um, and so you're seeing these kind of, uh, these things coming before at an uh, at, uh, aircraft engineering, uh, aircraft factory uh, called Antonov. Uh, the Antonov Aircraft Factory. There have been uh, big strikes against privatization and so on. People have clashed with police, all this kind of stuff. So you're seeing these uh, these class elements uh, beginning to move forward, come to the fore, uh, and break out, uh, which obviously, in, under the conditions, is inevitable. Um, and this really is what is required to solve the problems in Ukraine. This is what's required to solve uh, the conflict between the east and west of the country. It's these measures, turning a, turning a civil war between uh, one half of the country against another into a class war between workers and, uh, and the oligarchs. That's how you can unite people, because as long as, the, uh, as, long as the, the people in the East are seen as separatists, as long as they're seen as wanting to break up Ukraine, they will uh, never be able to get the anyone, workers or oligarchs in the West, onto their side. 
Um, but as long, if they begin to expropriate the oligarchs, begin to paint, point out the fact that it's the oligarchs who are the root of this problem. It's them who are causing all this suffering. It's them who are pursuing their own interests and, uh, and causing war and everything else on that basis. Uh, then, and, and it's us, the working class, who, uh, who can offer a solution to that through expropriation, democratic control, and all the rest of it. Then you'll be able to unite workers in the east and west of the country and, uh, and solve this, uh, this conflict. That's really where the hope lies. So the fact that this is emerging is, is very good. Um, but uh, but at the present time, as I say, this is a very small scale of stuff. And actually, East and West remain very much uh, divided. Um, so and and this so I'll come on to the elections that happened on uh, Sunday just uh, quickly. Um, the, uh, the ceasefire agreement recognised some autonomy for Luhansk and Donetsk for the People's Republics there. So uh, uh, what you've seen, I mean, it's, it's partly, well, first of all, they have separate elections. They've got elections coming up in those places in, uh, in, a, in a beginning of November. And, uh, and as well, I mean, if you look at a map of kind of voter turnout on Sunday, so these were parliamentary elections that took place on Sunday. If you look at voter turnout in the East, very few people voted. Turnout in the East was extremely low. Um, <clears throat> turnout overall across the whole country was 52%, roughly. Um, and that's down from 2012 when it was 58%, and in the presidential elections that happened, uh, it was about 60%. So it's low. It's a low turnout nationally, anyway. Uh, the highest turnout was in Lviv in the west with 69%. The lowest turnouts were all in the east. So Luhansk and Donetsk, 31% of people turned out, and this is only in the areas where they were called to vote. There were areas in Luhansk and Donetsk where no voting took place at all. Uh, and obviously Crimea is now not part of the Ukraine, so there was no uh, voting there. Um, and Odessa as well, only a 40% uh, turnout for the vote. So in the East, very few people voted because, uh, because they don't really see the point. This is a, this is a government dominated by, uh, that has been dominated, a political scene dominated by uh, right-wingers. There's been censorship of the press. About 17 newspapers have been shut down throughout the course of uh, the election campaigning. At one point, uh, one of the parties officially announced that the Communist Party had withdrawn from the election. It hadn't. They just announced that it had. Uh, you've seen uh, newspaper offices trashed and so on. And you've had the continuation of white terror against, uh, against left organisations, continued attacks on the Communist Party and so on. And the legal case uh, to ban the Communist Party uh, is still there. So uh, it's not surprising that people in the East don't really feel like this is an election worth uh, voting in. Obviously, the history of Ukrainian elections as well is one uh, filled with corruption, where <coughs> oligarchs buy a certain number of votes, they determine who's in their electoral lists and everything else. So people in the East really didn't see uh, much point. And, uh, and the results then are partly a reflection of that, partly a reflection of the, of the divisions that still exist between uh, the different wings of the oligarchy, of the bourgeoisie in uh, Ukraine. So uh, these, these figures I have are, are with about not just over 98% of the votes counted. Um, but the, uh, the Popular Front, or the People's Front Party, it's worth pointing out actually that Poroshenko, the current president, he made a block with uh, the, the mayor of uh, Kiev. Uh, to, to run a load of candidates. He was expecting, he was hoping, I actually read uh, an article in The Economist uh, just at the beginning of this week before the elections took place, or sorry, last week before the elections took place. Um, they were assuming they would win. They were assuming about 40% uh, win for Poroshenko's bloc. A kind of uh, nationalist, yeah, Ukrainian nationalist, but, uh, but looking for a bit of stability, uh, had quite a lot. Of, they, they were kind of the far-sighted, more far-sighted bourgeois, more far-sighted oligarchs they had. Uh, supporting them, and they were going to reform things and, and keep up the propaganda against people in the East. But it wasn't really a it wasn't really a pro a rapidly pro war party or anything else. He was obviously the one who signed the ceasefire agreement. He was expecting about forty percent. He actually got uh, twenty one point eight percent, so very badly compared to what they were expecting. And actually, ahead of that party, ahead of Poroshenko, with twenty two percent, was the Popular Front. Which is, a, which is a rapidly pro-war party. This is made up of, uh, of the Prime Minister, it's his party, the Interior Minister, and, uh, and, hang on, I've got it written down, and the, Parliament, and the Speaker of the uh, Parliament. And this is a very pro-Washington party. It's probably the most explicitly pro-Washington party. Poroshenko is a bit more clever about it. Um, but, uh, but this Popular Front is explicitly pro-Washington and very pro-war. It's got its own military committee, not part of the state, 
the party has a military committee made up of the commanders of the various volunteer battalions, all these, uh, these fascist extreme right battalions. They form this uh, military committee that is part of this party that seems to have got the highest uh, percentage of the vote uh, in the uh, elections. There's a fairly new party as well, uh, with a name that translates to something like self-defense or self-reliance. And, uh, and they seem to have got 11%. And uh, it's led by the mayor of Lviv, the mayor of this town in the west. Um, but uh, the second person in the list after, after him, after the mayor, uh, the second person is the commander of the Donbass Battalion, so the commander of yet another uh, uh, volunteer uh, extreme right uh, battalion. And they've, uh, they've got 11% in, in the election. Now the opposition bloc is the name of another party. They got nine, uh, about 9.5%. Nine and, and this is basically made up of former uh, Yanukovych's old party, basically. It, used to be, it was called Party of the Regions. It's now been banned. But most of the people then are standing under this new name of the opposition bloc. Uh, and they've, they've, got mo they've got some oligarchs in there as well, uh, mostly from the east and the south, and, uh, and they got about 9.5%. And then you've got a party uh, called the Radical Party, led by a guy called Liashko, who uh, is a bit of a populist. He's also a complete, uh, complete reactionary. He's, uh, this is a guy who's spent the last few years uh, roaming around, he's, a, he's been a member of parliament, roaming around in black military fatigues, arresting people for... But with no authority to do so, uh, just, tell it, just arresting them, making them do things that, uh, that he wants them to do, uh, surrounded by armed thugs and all the rest of it. And, uh, and uh, this is a guy then who has been elected uh, to parliament, along with other members of his party, also uh, made up of extreme right uh, elements. And, uh, and the Fatherland Party as well, again, one of these extreme right parties has got just over 5%, which is the threshold for getting into the, into the parliament. Now, <clears throat> Svoboda uh, hasn't made the 5% threshold, uh, neither has the Communist Party. Now, um, <clears throat> lots of, uh, the, if you read the, the Western newspapers, uh, they, were all, they were all saying, look, uh, this election demonstrates that European values have won in Ukraine. European the Communist Party hasn't, hasn't got in, and neither has Svoboda, Svoboda being a far-right uh, party. Therefore, European values have won. Well, firstly, on Svoboda. Um, uh, clearly, yeah, it hasn't uh, made the uh, made five percent threshold. But uh, but the neo Nazis, the fascists, they're not only in uh, Svoboda. They're not. Uh, that's that's not where they all congregate. As I've said, the commanders of these uh, various battalions are in uh, different parts of the Popular Front and uh, and uh, others. And uh, and there's all kinds of people part of the Social Nationalist uh, Forum and, and, and so on. Social Nationalist Assembly, rather. Uh, who are part of the Ashko's radical party and this kind of thing? They're in all these parts, all these radical, extreme right, neo-fascist uh, elements. They're in all. They're scattered across all of these uh, different parties, and a number of them also have stood as independents, uh, which I'll come on to, uh, to get elected as well. So the idea that uh, European values have won uh, in this election is, uh, is is a myth. It's, it's completely wrong. Uh, and the reason, obviously, the Communist Party didn't do so well, well, its strongholds are in the East, where very few people turned out to vote. Uh, obviously, the first point is it's been massively repressed, and there's been a campaign against it, uh, physical and political, for, uh, using all kinds of dirty tactics for a very long time, obviously. Um, but uh, most of its votes in the East, where very few people turned out, it also had a stronghold in Crimea, which is now no longer part of uh, Ukraine. So it's really not surprising that uh, the Communist Party has suffered the way it has. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, but as I say, yeah, despite this squabble of failure, then, or seeming uh, failure of the far right to get into Parliament, you still see people like, uh, there's a guy called Dmitry Yarosh and Borislav Varetsa, who are the main leaders of this right sector group. They stood as independents, but with agreement, with a kind of arrangement with the, with the Popular Front, uh, this party that's done really well, where the Popular Front withdrew their candidates in the regions that they were standing, uh, in order to allow these people to get elected, and they got elected with 29-30% uh, of the vote, each of them. Um, Bilitsky, who's the commander of the uh, Azov Regiment, or the founder of the Azov Regiment, he's again stood as an independent, but with agreement from the Popular Front to withdraw their candidate, and he's uh, been elected as well. And, uh, and there's various others, I mean, I've got a list of names, I won't get through them, but there's various others who have, uh, who have been elected into, uh, into the Parliament, who are openly Nazi apologists, openly uh, pro-fascist uh, people, uh, and extreme right, and they're all Oh, a large uh, portion of them, particularly this Popular Front Party, are pro-war in the East. 
Um, and, uh, and this isn't all, obviously, over the last uh, few days. The, one of the main ideologues from Svoboda actually quit the party to become uh, the, uh, the head of the Department for Propaganda and Analysis in the Ukrainian Security Service. It has to, it, you have to not be a member of a party to take that role. So he was part of Svoboda. He left. He was the main ideologue. He was an open uh, Nazi sympathizer. Uh, and he left the party and has taken up this role in the security service. Uh, you've also seen uh, earlier in October, you saw a demonstration. Thousands of people marched, thousands of far-right, extreme-right people marched uh, to celebrate the Ukrainian insurgent army, this, this group that allied itself with the Nazis, hailing them as heroes and so on, and there's a motion to put the parliament to recognize them as such, recognize them as national heroes, this kind of thing. And one of these marches was held under the demand of banning communist ideology in groups and so on. So uh, you can see the strength of fascism in Ukraine, of extreme right, anti-communist, uh, anti not only in uh, politics, but in, in terms of like, physical attacks on left organizations. Um, you can see the, the presence that they have in the parliament and in uh, the government as a whole. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I think then, it, it, on the basis of the election results from Sunday, uh, and these other things that are going on, uh, I think we can look to the future and say, well, look, there's, uh, there's a high chance of there being an escalation in the war. The right wing, the extreme right, are very unhappy about the ceasefire agreement that was, uh, that was signed, precisely because it gave some sort of autonomy to Luhansk and Donetsk. And they're saying, look, we went and fought in the east for a, for a pure Ukraine, as they put it, for a united Ukraine, and, uh, and now you've given, you've given uh, these, these things away to these rebels, these separatists, as they call them. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and, that's no good. and immediately, actually, when that ceasefire agreement was, uh, was made, the right sector threatened to march on Kiev in protest. Um, and so uh, now, these pro-war parties, extreme right groups, have a much stronger base in uh, Parliament. They've got a base in the government. And, uh, and they've got allies in uh, Washington. Because, uh, uh, well, yeah, it's, not, it's certainly in the US's interest to, uh, to keep trying to strike blows against Russia and so on uh, in Ukraine. So uh, I think we can look towards uh, like the escalation and certainly greater repression of, uh, of any left movements or groups in Ukraine. Now the role of Marxists is obviously to fight fascism wherever we find it, in any form. Our, our job has to be to fight fascism. Now that means physically, uh, and so we should support the people in Ukraine doing that. Obviously us here, we can't physically fight fascism in Ukraine because we're not in Ukraine. Um, but uh, obviously physical opposition to fascism is not enough. It's a political question as well. We have to understand where fascism comes from. Fascism is the product of capitalism in decline. And, uh, and so the, the real way to eliminate fascism at its root is to get rid of capitalism. Um, and, uh, and so our role as Marxists is to make that argument, understand the nature of capitalism, understand the ideas of socialism and Marxism, and, uh, and then <coughs> offer advice, guidance, uh, financial contributions, anything to left organizations fighting for socialism. In, uh, in Ukraine. And obviously our role in Britain as Marxists is to expose the lies of the, of the Western, of the British media, and the fact that our government is, proper, is supporting financially and politically a government in Ukraine that's propped up by fascists. So we have to have meetings like this to discuss these, uh, these facts, what's really going on in Ukraine, uh, and this is the role of the solidarity of the anti-fascist resistance in the Ukraine campaign. And uh, obviously it's the role of the, uh, of the international Marxist tendency to do as it has been doing, uh, correspond with, for example, people in uh, in Baropa in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, there was uh, there was a member of Baropa, a representative from Baropa at the International Marxist Tendencies uh, World Congress in the, in the summer to offer <coughs> advice and guidance on how to fight capitalism, how to build a, a workers' movement, and so on uh, for the overthrow of capitalism uh, and fighting for socialism in Ukraine. This is our role, uh, and this is what we should all try and involve ourselves in. Uh, and hopefully some of you will be keen to get involved with that. All right, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll come back to some of these points then. Um, well, as uh, I think Tom said, um, yeah, the, the, the devil is in the detail, isn't it, really, on these points of uh, agreement and disagreement, that you can agree broadly, but uh, 
but yeah, we're, we're, we've got to talk in concrete terms. You know, we can't talk in abstracts, and, uh, and therefore we, need, we do need to get down into these details. Um, so, uh, so Omar uh, says that the solidarity with the Ukraine, anti-fascist resistance in Ukraine, uh, comes across as a little bit uh, apologetic for Russian nationalism. Um, but uh, but I, I think the point has been made that uh, Putin is not the main enemy here. I think that's the, that's the point to emphasise. Putin, Putin is not the man who, uh, as, as has been uh, suggested, who, uh, who sparked this entire thing. He wasn't the one. I mean, it was said uh, people fear the government in Kiev because of Russia whipping up that kind of fear. I don't think that's uh, right at all. I think that's entirely backwards. It was the government in Kiev that incorporated uh, far-right fascist elements into it. It was the government in Kiev that passed this uh, language law. It was this that caused people to fear the government. That, Russia didn't force the Kiev government to do that. That was actually a pro-Western government that, uh, that was behaving in this way. I mean, you mentioned, um, we, can, we can kind of talk about chronology in, in this way. Russia, now there's no doubt about it, Putin is an opportunist, an imperialist and an opportunist. And he saw, I mean, so for example, puppets, it was referred to, puppets of Russian nationalism were referred to. Uh, now there's no doubt, I disagree with that term, because although Putin is an opportunist, then he will make the most of these... Uh, this ridiculous behaviour by the West, this provocative behaviour by the Kiev government, he'll make the most of it to assert his influence. The idea that he's been pulling all the strings from the beginning, uh, whip it, you know, very, very cleverly uh, making sure that the Kiev government acts in a very pro provocative way to people in the East, and incorporates fascists into its government and so on, I don't think that's, uh, that's right at all. So the idea that Putin is behind all of this, Putin's the main enemy, it's all Putin's fault. Um, I don't think that should be our emphasis at all. I think that's uh, wrong. So uh, that does not equate. Uh, that does not equate to apologism for Russian nationalism, as has been said. I don't think uh, you know no Marxist would uh, be an apologist for any kind of nationalism, uh, and certainly not Russian imperialism. But uh, the idea that Putin is the main enemy, I think, is uh, is wrong. And uh, and on this question of self determination, it was said, well, Russia doesn't support self determination for. Uh, the people of Ukraine, and that's quite clear. But uh, but neither does the EU. In fact, look at what the EU is doing in Ukraine now. Uh, they're uh, they're imposing the IMF and the EU. They're imposing massive austerity. Yeah, they're bailing them out with huge, with with massive strings attached, massive uh, cuts and privatizations and all the rest of it. The idea that uh, that that is the Ukrainian people determining their own destiny is nonsense. It's laughable. But ordinary people in Ukraine have no uh, say over that. That's being imposed by one wing of the bourgeois. Just like uh, Yanukovych was another wing of the bourgeois that preferred the Russian uh, deal on the table. The idea that uh, that, that represents uh, self-determination, I think, is, uh, is wrong. Um, and yeah, this question of, well, the EU doesn't play the same imperialist role in Ukraine as, uh, as Russia. Well, that's what it's doing right now, with, through the IMF and through the austerity and through the cuts and everything else. It is playing that role. Uh, at the moment, and uh, and as has been said, the U.S. is, is by far the, the, the strongest imperialist power in, on the planet. Uh, and then we had this idea that the armed people in the East are the most reactionary force. I think is how well, the armed people are the most reactionary forces. I think is how it was put. Um, but uh, the reality is that the armed people in the East at the moment are the people who took up arms against the government that sent fascists to shell their homes. The idea that those people fighting the fascists, the idea that those people have taken up arms to combat the uh, attacks by their own government on their homes, are the most reactionary force in Ukraine, I don't think is uh, tenable. I don't think that's right at all. These people uh, are defending themselves against uh, extreme right elements, these uh, volunteer battalions and so on. Uh, the logic, basically, of an argument that says, uh, well, the armed people in the East are the most reactionary force, the logic of that leads you to condemn the struggle of ordinary people in the East against fascism. That's where that argument gets you. And so I don't think that's an argument that we should be making. Um, so uh, on this question of the, of the fascists in the East of Ukraine and in the, in the People's Republics and so on, as I mentioned, there's this guy Strelkov, he's an example, though he's no longer the leader of the armed resistance. He resigned uh, that position. Um, <clears throat> there are obviously... Uh, these elements there, the present, these trends, and so on, uh, and no one is denying that, and no one is, uh, no one is, oh, we're, we're all condemning, as we uh, as we should, but uh, but what was kind of noticeably absent, I would say, is uh, from from 
from Manoma is who these people are, what organisations they're a part of. Um, and I think that's really significant because obviously from the point of view of the government you can point to parties, organisations, groups being funded by the government, by the West and everything else. And you can point to their, their careful organisation, their, their, you can name the individuals who've been elected as MPs and everything else. And, uh, and while there might be these individuals in the East who uh, do play these roles and have these ideas and so on, uh, the idea that they're organised and have a, pro a political programme in any kind that's comparable in any way to the fascists and the fascist organisations in the West that are being funded indirectly uh, by the EU, obviously because the EU give government or give money to the Kiev government, who then uh, employ fascists to fight for them. The idea that there's an equal balance between the threat of fascism in the West and the threat from uh, these individuals in the East, I don't think is tenable either. The real threat is from Kiev and from the West and from the funding that they give to fascists. Uh, so yeah, we can uh, we can condemn, we do condemn, and we do uh, argue against and fight against people uh, who try and uh, capture positions of power in the People's Republics in the East. The idea that they are an equivalent threat to the people in the West, the idea that they're mobilised and organised in any kind of similar way, I don't think is uh, the way it talks. Um, and uh, and yeah, and this question then of. Uh, well, people have the right not to be invaded by uh, Russia. Would we support what Russian withdrawal and these kind of questions? First of all, I mean, uh, no one is denying again that there are clearly a few uh, Russian agents and military personnel and so on in the east of Ukraine. The idea, as has been put out by Putin, that these people wandered into Ukraine by accident is uh, obviously nonsense. Um, but uh, but I, am, uh, I have yet to see any evidence that there has been a full-scale Russian invasion. Tens of thousands, Poroshenko said, tens of thousands of Russian troops invading Ukraine. Uh, this was the this was it. so. I mean, I, I, there's no evidence that all they produced for that. The only evidence they produced for that was some grainy satellite pictures. The same people who produced satellite pictures saying that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. Grainy sat on, the, on Google Maps, I can get clearer satellite pictures than what these people produced of the so-called Russian invasion. Um, so, and, and beyond that, I've seen no evidence. You certainly don't need the hypothesis of a Russian invasion to explain why the anti-terrorist operation was defeated. They were, as I said, they were demoralized, they were, in, uh, they were on, an occupying force in the east and so on. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so yeah, again, I, as I say, I'm, I'm not really uh, convinced by this. I think, uh, actually, because, um, uh, yeah, it was said that the solution to this is to preserve the democratic rights of all, of all these people and so on. I think uh, the big problem, and I think this was brought out by, by Rob and, and Nina's points, is that we cannot think in abstract terms. The idea of talking about self-determination in the abstract, or we stand for self-determination, uh, or the idea of talking about, well, we stand for democratic rights in the abstract, doesn't really tell us anything. That's not, that's not good enough, because self-determination doesn't mean anything in Ukraine. It's, I, like, as I say, like, at the moment, neither Russia nor the EU supports the right of Ukrainian people to self-determination. So and, and the Ukrainian uh, people are not strong enough. There are no mass organizations strong enough to fight against both these imperial powers that are tussling over the, the future of Ukraine. So, uh, so to talk about self-determination in the abstract is basically just to sit, as Rob says, to sit there and do nothing. And it's the same, the idea that, well, all we need to do is preserve democratic rights. That's what we need to stand for, preservation of democratic rights. But, uh, but it's, it's, it's a very abstract formulation. It's just, as Nina says, it's just reading from the book of Marxism and saying, well, if you're not going to do it, then we're having nothing to do with you. Um, the, uh, it, I mean, it's, it would be the equivalent, say, to saying, uh, for example, in Israel and Palestine, to just saying, well, uh, you know what, the solution to all of this is just to have two democratic capitalist states, two bourgeois democratic capitalist states, uh, and that is the solution to the conflict. But, I mean, that is an entirely abstract thing to say, obviously, because Israel would never allow that to happen. They would never allow a bourgeois democratic state in the form of Palestine. It simply would not. So to, so to advance that as a slogan is, uh, is, is, the equivalent, is, is the same as saying nothing. Basically, it's the same as, uh, as just kind of abstractly reading in a dogmatic way from the book of Marxism. Um, <clears throat> So we can't talk in uh, abstracts, and we have, to, we have to point to the fact that actually the solution, the problem here, is capitalism, and, uh, and the capitalist crisis in the country, the oligarchs fighting over, over the spoils in, uh, in Ukraine and so on, that's causing a civil war. The solution then is not uh, abstract democratic rights like self-determination or anything else. Um, we have to put it in concrete terms, and concretely, 
All you can say is the solution is the expropriation of the oligarchs in order to unite the people uh, across the country. And, uh, and that really is, is, the, is what Marxism is about. We have to be concrete. We cannot just talk in abstracts. Uh, and, it, and yeah, it comes down to this point about how you fight fascism. It's a concrete question. It's not just about, uh, it's not just about kind of reciting uh, things abstractly. It's a concrete question. And, and that doesn't mean uh, uncritically aligning, as Rob said, it doesn't mean uncritically aligning yourself with other groups who might also have an interest in fighting fascism. Um, I mean, uh, the, and, and the, the, the history of uh, Marxism is obviously pepper. I mean, we, we drew some historical analogies. There's uh, the fight against fascism. Trotsky called in Germany for a united front of all groups opposed to fascism to fight fascism. Right? That wasn't what a united front was. It was. It, you okay. know. You know that. It wasn't. It was. It wasn't a popular front. That's right. Exactly. exactly. Which, which, a popular, popular front, front is what you just described. And a united front, which is a, a grouping of lots of different uh, left organisations. Yeah, that's true. On the um, Eastern Ukraine. But they weren't all fighting. <laughs> they weren't all fighting, were they, for socialist revolution? No. But they were fighting yeah. fascism, and that is the. Uh, that's the role of. That's the role of. Uh, of the United Front, and Lenin, Lenin had the famous phrase, "March together." Uh, sorry, strike together, but march separate. With who? And that's uh, and that's the role of uh, that's the role of Marxists, and that's how we have to fight fascism, right? And the Communist Party in the east of Ukraine clearly is not uh, a healthy Marxist organisation, but uh, the solidarity of the anti-fascist resistance in, campaign, in Ukraine campaign is advocating solidarity with uh, the Communist Party, not because we think they're brilliant Marxists or anything else. But because they have a, an interest in fighting against fascism, and it's the same, uh, it's the same with uh, Barot Bo is a, an amalgamation of all kinds of different uh, Marxist trends. We advocate uh, a policy of the of the United Front, but it's a concrete question then of looking for ways, looking for the organisations we can use to fight fascism, and looking at where the threat of fascism is coming from. Now, it doesn't mean allying yourself. I mean, you, so you say we're allying ourselves with this uh, with these Russians, who, as I say, are, are not there. I mean, there is no Russian invasion. There aren't Russian troops on the ground who the Marxists are allying themselves with. It's a, it's a, it's a fiction. Um, so, uh, so like, this, is, this is what we have to talk about in, in concrete terms. The, uh, the fight against fascism um, has to be talked about concretely, not talking in entirely abstract terms about democratic rights and so on. Um, and this, then, is, is what the IMT does. Uh, this is what the international Marxist tendency tries to do. We, uh, we study the ideas of Marxism, we have discussions uh, like this on theoretical questions as well as current events. But we don't just talk about it, we apply it. We try and apply it to, to everyday events and, uh, and the real world as we find it. And, uh, and the, the IMT has sections then in countries all over the world, including in Russia. So the task of the Marxists in Britain is to fight against fascism in Britain, fight against the government that is propping up the Kiev government, uh, which incorporates fascist elements and, uh, and expose their lies and so on. And the task of the Russian Marxists is to fight against uh, Putin and any elements of fascism that might exist in Russia in however disorganized and sporadic uh, a form. Um, and, uh, and what I would say is if you are uh, serious about fighting fascism uh, through using the ideas of Marxism and by fighting for socialism, then you should join the IMT. Uh, and join us uh, here in Britain to fight against fascism uh, and unite with our comrades in Russia uh, and all over the world. <clears throat>